Welcome again, everyone. Um, <clears throat> happy to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Mara, Mara Young, and I'm a longtime old yogi member of the center and um, practitioner, also a community Dharma leader and um, psychotherapist and Buddhist informed and, and been on the path of practitioner for many decades and always a beginner, always learning, always um, um, welcome the opportunity actually for deeper, a deeper um, opportunity like my, part of my practice of sharing the Dharma also um, takes me on a journey and a time to go deeper into study and practice as well. So I'm honored to be here tonight, and uh, and Shelley, um, who usually teaches on Wednesday night, requested um, one of us other teachers to step in. So I'm really happy to um, offer um, to uh, support her practice as well um, in that way. So thanks for having me. So tonight's topic is taking refuge and protection in the Dharma. Um, my subtitle might be um, a wash in Dharma rain. And I usually like to start with a poem. And uh, I have a couple I'd like to share as an inspiration. And, and in this Zoom room, just, just care for yourself. And, 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 you know, if you wish, just listening with the ears of the heart, taking in whatever may be of support to you tonight. So this is um, from the Lotus Sutra. The rain falls everywhere, coming down on all four sides. Its flow and saturation are measureless reaching to every area of the earth, to the ravines and the valleys, of the mountains and the streams, to the remote and secluded places where grow plants, bushes, medicinal herbs, trees large and small, a hundred grains, rice seedlings, sugar cane, grapevines. The rain moistens them all, none fails, to receive its full share. The Dharma reign of the Buddhist teachings bring fresh life and promise to all beings, abundant and available to all. Dharma reign offers liberation from suffering and freedom in awakening. And this is part of a poem called Praise the Rain from Joy Harjo, a Native American poet Laurier. Praise crazy, praise sad, praise the path on which we're led, praise the roads on earth and water, praise the eater and the eaten, praise beginnings, praise the end, praise the song and praise the singer, praise the rain, it brings more rain, praise the rain, it brings more rain. This is from her poem, Praise the Rain, from her collection on conflict resolution for holy beings. So here we are in this um, world of such great um, uncertainty, challenge, suffering. Um, um, I just um, looked at the news of the, the um, heartbreak of the earthquake in Afghanistan today. You know, my heart, our hearts broken as we hear more details about the Vivaldi, Vivaldi shootings and what occurred there. The hearings from January 6th, the shootings, just so much happening. And meanwhile, the summer solstice, the abundance, the verdant gifts of nature, 
my heart was deeply touched as um, the topic tonight about taking refuge um, in the 100 degree day. Here we are with the climate changes um, happening to our, our earth. And uh, I was um, driving back from um, a session I was had with a client. It was bright and light and day. And um, I rounded the corner near a block, a couple blocks from my house. And my eye caught um, a mama raccoon with her kit hanging from her mouth. And my heart was deeply touched with tenderness as she trotted across the lawn and took refuge into the um, sewer. <laughs> the, the part in the side just went right down there with that kit, looked like a, I didn't, I think, I hope it was alive. It looked like a pretty exhausted kit. <laughs> Uh, child raccoon. And I just felt like, oh, you know, my mind made this story of refuge of like, maybe they had been in the cool woods, and then it started to get too hot to 100 degrees and over more and that they went for the cool refuge. Um, recently, um, one of my Tibetan teachers um, in the Vajrayana Tibetan tradition, Mingyur Rinpoche, was in town. He's an author of The Joy of Living and Turgar Meditation Center, um, where I also practice um, and evolved. And um, he, he, he shared in the Rikan retreat when he was here in Minneapolis a few weeks ago that the the Tibetan, I had never heard this, that the Tibetan word, and don't ask me to tell you what the, it is in Tibetan, uh, for the Dharma is protection or protector. And I hadn't heard that that way quite before. There's the three refuges, the triple gem. They're often called the, the um, you know, these are the the three characteristics, the, the triple gem, the three treasures, the three jewels, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And Dharma being the wisdom aspect, the, the practices, the teachings, all the, the skillful means, the relationship we have to the three characteristics, which are also called the, th the Dharma seals, the three Dharma seals. And when he talked about which are suffering or dukkha, impermanence, anicca, everything changes, and anatta, the selfless nature of things, the impersonal nature, the emptiness, and quality, spaciousness, if you will. And uh, it really um, hit, um, came home to me about the protection and that how much we can go for the refuge of the Dharma protection, of the wisdom, the teachings. And Mingyur Rinpoche also talks about inner and outer refuges. So often we're taking outer refuges, and I want to explore this as an inquiry together, not just talk at you, but share some teachings, share some things, and then also to inquire, what do I take refuge in? Or what are my refuges? And what does that mean for me? Um, when Shelley reached out to me, she said that she had been teaching, um, and I don't know how far you are, I think it may be completed, from Sharon Salzberg's beautiful, beautiful book on faith, and not faith in something outside and doctrine, but trusting your own deepest experience. And for me, the trusting the Dharma is like the gateway of trusting my deepest experience. It supports me in the inner refuge as well as the outer refuge. And I'll share a little more about that. But I loved <clears throat> sharing some of the quotes and it, and it gave me an opportunity to revisit what she said about refuge. And and, in, and even if it's repetitive, I hope you'll forgive me um, because I think <clears throat> it's so beautiful 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, she says that um, on her first retreat with Goenka, that he explained that they begin a retreat by taking refuge in the three jewels, the Dharma, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, and that we're about to open ourselves, he told us, to a deep process of seeing and freeing ourselves from old patterns, and that we would need to feel a sense of safety in order to accomplish this. And that as all of us go through these times in our lives and in the world where we feel like we're lost in a wilderness, caught in a violent storm, exposed, vulnerable, we look for someone or something to help us through the upheaval. We look for a place of safety. And as many as of us have discovered, the refuge may be sought in relationships, in ideals, in points of view, in chocolate, in um, you know, all kinds of things, in the internet, and ultimately it lets us down. So when I read that, I thought, oh yes, the protection of the Dharma, feeling safe, feeling held in this spacious wisdom that's so vast and directs me to look deeply and recognize that the awareness and the Buddha nature within me, that the inner refuge is in our own wisdom, our own inner Buddha nature, our own wise heart mind. And um, he said that, Goenka said that finding a spiritual refuge is a significant step on the journey of faith. A trustworthy refuge enables us to go against the promises of an unexamined world. He says, as if he were speaking directly to me, that, um, that I had been yearning for a refuge, a safe home, and that my thoughts, fleeting thoughts and feelings that were always shifting was no longer a safe haven and that even often the wrenching experiences of my life, that I needed a wholly different kinds of refuge. So Sharon, who shared so vulnerably and poignantly the traumas and losses of her childhood, of losing her parents to death and abandonments. And, um, and then at 18 years old, I loved when she asked, uh, Trungpa um, Rinpoche, um, what should I do? I'm going to India. And what did he say? He basically said, you know, how should I prepare? And I don't know if I, I wrote the exact words down, but he basically said, by, go by accident. Just, just see what unfolds, you know, no plan, no, no advice other than to let go and just let the, essentially the stream of Dharma take it. Let the, let the intention in your heart just, just guide you. And there she was. She was in India and she met teachers and teachings and, um, and the Dharma was, was a refuge for her. So it can be for us. Mingyur Rinpoche says, in order to eliminate <clears throat> suffering, we need the supreme protector, which is dharma. It is dharma that can really save us from samsara. Um, samsara meaning the greed, the hatred, the delusion. We see this at work in the world. We see just how confused and how um, heartless and, and bizarre when we're thinking that external certain things, money in the bank and power and greed and hatred and delusion, they're, they're fed by some deep desire to be happy, to be fulfilled. And, and we can take, we're, we're kind of lost in this samsara, in the worldly winds. And by following the path of dharma, which means practice, we can develop self-realization. The main point, he says, of our entire practice is to recognize our own awareness and to nurture it. Imagination is a wonderful support for that. 
in the context of taking refuge, we can rest our awareness on, the, on a sense of what a refuge tree or like um, we can think of those others um, who've gone before us, the, the, the historical Buddha. We can think about others on the path of the Dharma, our teachers like Sharon or perhaps Mark or Shelley and also those that they, they train with, you know, whether it's from the Vipassana tradition, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Cornfield, and their teachers, you know, from Burma and from um, Thailand, and, you know, all of the teachers, all the Buddhas, all the ancestors over the last 2,500 years. So, um, and we can um, even just looking in nature, we can, we can see the dharma we can see through dharma eyes so the use of physical sensations sounds even awareness itself in order to eliminate suffering we need the supreme protector which is the dharma and that only that and that um, we can aspire to be free from suffering but we don't have to have a clear idea of the destination it starts to come into view through the path unfolding of the Dharma. And I really love this part. This connection to the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha is not rigid. It's not concrete bridge. It's not a concrete bridge. Well, I'll take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and it's gonna take me whatever. It's more like it can, it's not a concrete bridge that connects one side of a river to another. It's that's designed to last for a thousand years. So see how you like this metaphor. It's more like an enchanted rope that slowly but inevitably draws the two shores closer together until they merge. And we realize <clears throat> that samsara is nirvana and that the outside Buddha and the inside Buddha are the same. Okay, now, is that kind of little mind blowing? Like what? We're just talking about samsara being out there. Well, instead of we talk about trying to get somewhere and go to the other shore, but on this inner journey of awakening, we discover that everything is already here, that we already have this capacity. It's who we are. And that Awareness is spacious and vast, and it, it touches into that anatta, that spacious, open quality where everything arises in its vastness. It, it goes beyond concept. It goes beyond right, wrong, good, bad, samsara, nirvana. All of that dissolves. So... Don't ask me how or to explain it. I'll just say, if you trust the Dharma and maybe just thinking, okay, there's a different way, a shift that will happen internally within me as I practice and as I apply this many skillful means of the Dharma. So I'll just leave that out there. And, and if, you're, if you're confused or it, it sounds crazy, um, I'm okay with it. Mingyur Rinpoche said it, not me. So, <laughs> but um, I kind of like when my concepts about the path get shaken up because it's not linear. It's not linear. And that when, when the, my mind is, is kind of like, I can't make sense of this, it actually can be an opening of, to a new threshold of understanding. So, um, I'd like you to drop in the inquiry question for yourself for a moment. And let's maybe take a moment to take a breath in stillness. I have, I have more to share. I always prepare enough for two or three Dharma talks. <laughs> um, so um, but ask yourself, what do I take refuge in? And be honest, it's okay. We're, we're all human beings. 
it's not about being sacred and um, what 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 do I take refuge in or what brings me a sense of, of refuge of feeling safe. And, and I'd like to open it up before I continue to any comments or questions. Um, I know that's not the usual um, order of things, but rather than wait till the end in the last 10 minutes, so whoever would like to share or um, what are, what's arising for them, um, please unmute and say your name and feel free to share when you're ready. I love for this to be a little more of a conversation, but I also don't want to pressure you, but, um, ah, someone unmuted. I can start. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, safe spaces, huh? I think, I think I had to find a physically safe space before I could find an internal one because the place that I found was inside my own home, but I had been living there that whole time and I didn't feel that level of comfort until I was seeking it out in a physical space and then set the intention to create that, uh, that space as a place of well-being. Um, I think the, the remarkable thing that I found was that it, it's it's just sitting in a room that I've been in dozens of times before, but without that intention, it didn't feel that way. And then remarkably, once I did that and was forced to, I would even also point out that this is during a global pandemic when I was forced to be at home all the time um, and had to make peace with what I had. I think that that made a huge difference opposed to having the supposed luxury of being able to try and chase every uh, possibility that could be out in the world to think that that would find, that would lead me to the piece that I was looking for. Um, so I think there was a real active um, discovery uh, of finding exactly, I think, I think exactly what you're talking about, where, um, I had to run around a whole bunch of different places to find out that it wasn't there. And then when I was forced to sit down, I found it within myself. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Sure. Thank, you. Um, thank you. Thanks for sharing. It sort of reminds me of Dorothy in her tapping her ruby slippers and there's no place like home, but that, then that the power of intention. You know, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a kind of a beautiful metaphor, you know, and um, Philip Moffat in his book, Dancing with Life, um, around, about suffering, um, talks about from T.S. Eliot, you know, you start from where you began and then, you know, that's the journey, come back home. Um, someone else want to share or say what, I, what you take refuge in or what are your refuges or? places of safety yeah so um this question highlights my uh my uh, uh what, what i'll call it my uh a la carte buddhism and how that's been a teacher for me um over time in that uh refuges in the past um sometimes don't don't uh, they're they're uh, they don't last as long as uh, as they promise uh, one of the places I've always felt safe is being outside in the wilderness and um, lots of 
things can't get me there, including the news. And uh, I find it very, very uh, peaceful. But when I go there striving for refuge, it doesn't work. When I'm leaving and going on the way, it, uh, it, uh, it's not there. And then I have to let go and it'll, uh, it'll show up. But this whole question of where is refuge and, and how, uh, you know, how, how sustainable is that? And, the, and what um, I found over time for me these last five or six years in, uh, in my practice is that uh, there's, there's a, a depth in the Dharma uh, that seems to, seems to always be there for me. And um, yeah, so I'll just I'll just leave it at that with uh, with uh, th that's my answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Just leave a few more moments to see if anyone else would like to share. Thank you. Um, and so um, and we'll have more time later. So, so Mingyur Rinpoche goes on to say um, that, uh, you know, everyone takes refuge in something, right? In relationships, locations, activities that offer the body or mind a sense of security and protection, even neurotic or unhealthy habits, eating too much chocolate, giggling compulsively can function as a protective ward to, shield to ward off feelings of anxiety and vulnerability. Um, you can, you know, um, you know, wherever we seek security and comfort, sometimes we're in love with social status. I think I can share this. Um, a Dharma sister of mine is um, providing some shelter to some refugees that came in recently. And um, one of them is in their 20s. And um, here they are basically homeless <laughs> and just landed here from their country, which is at war. And, um, and she mentioned something to me about um, that the young woman wanted a car. She wanted to work any way she possibly could to get a car. And I just thought, oh, oh, you know, like, like that would be her refuge that she could have a car and she could have wheels and kind of, when I think about, you know, and then it brought to mind, of course, my first car in my early 20s, 21, 22, a beat up, rebuilt 1960s Volkswagen with holes in the floor and just, just how liberating that was. I was so attached to that car and, um, Anyway, everything, it was falling apart. It was actually a Dharma car because it was literally impermanent. It was literally holes in the floor and rain coming in and doors that wouldn't open and windshield wipers that wouldn't work. And it, the, the paint job was bleached out. It was like a complete Dharma car. But I, it was my first car and I took refuge in it. So, you know, but our car may break down. Our, our um, perfect partner may walk out or we might have bankruptcy. Many people lost a lot in the pandemic and that everything goes up and down, wealth and um, everything. And that um, when we place our trust in them, our minds go up and down like flags flapping in the wind. We live with a sense of lack that we long to fill the monkey mind habitually tries to merge with something, particularly another person, in order to alleviate a pervasive sense of inadequacy. Yet all these samsaric refuges, as we just said, were, are impermanent and rely on permanence where none exists. And, and um, so emotions can also become refuges. refuges. We can respond with anger and self righteousness and blame. I just find that the blame blame game going on in the political divides and like it's your fault, it's this party's fault, it's their fault and 
I mean, everyone is blaming and blaming and not really doing the deeper look and recognizing what are those causes and conditions, taking responsibility, owning the actions, ownership of actions, seeing that things interconnect causes and conditions. Excuse me, my um, cat decided to walk in. Oh, there she is. Yes, you're going to say hello. Um, okay. Um, so, um, taking refuge. Um, so, so when we take this inner refuge, when we learn with the Dharma how to relate to difficulties, how it can protect us from despair and confusion, you know, how we can begin to work with what normally was unworkable. And as I mentioned, being someone that um, works a lot with people with grief and loss and life transitions, um, that, that, you know, depression, anxiety, it's gone rampant, you know, we're in a mental health crisis, I don't say that lightly. Um, you know, it's, it really helps to have a refuge of like these wisdom practices. How many of you do like that acronym, the RAIN method, talk about Dharma RAIN, RAIN, you know, recognition, acceptance, investigation or curiosity, nurture, or non-attachment. You know, you're just, you have some skillful means to use the awareness, you know, just even simple things like recognizing, oh, I'm lost in aversion in this moment, or here's what fear feels like this in the body, like, or, or just taking the support of one's own breath or taking a seat or taking a moment to pause. Um, I often tell this story when I give talks because it was a very powerful one. But like when I, a couple of us taught mindfulness in the Shakopee prison where people, you know, the, their violence, their conditioning brought them into prison or their addictions and all kinds of circumstance. And, and one of the inmates who took the course twice and would come to weekly to offerings whenever there was meditation and yoga in the prison, who used to be just rageful. It was like a heat that came off of her. And she ended up in segregation many, many times in the prison because of the anger that would sweep her away. And as she practiced over time, she came in to the lat, one of the class and she said, I am not my anger. She had awareness and she didn't react and act out of her anger. She said, I am angry, but I'm not my anger. And wow, you know, so the power of awareness that can save your life, you know, can save your life. You know, really how many times somebody cuts us off in traffic <laughs> if you just want to, you know, and it's like, okay, you know, may they be, may I be safe and protected? May they be safe and protected? All these different ways that we can cultivate wisdom, compassion, patience, qualities of an awakened heart, my, the paramitas. So this is the refuge in the Dharma. It's like having these many, many ways I don't know if any of you are familiar. It's another sort of version of Rain, um, Lama Rod Owen's book, um, Love and Rage. Um, highly recommend it. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel a lot of um, outrage and, and it's really hard um, to refrain from yelling at the TV when I hear the, some of the news. And so um, this is, also using taking refuge in the Dharma and the practices, like he has an acronym. He says, this is a weird acronym. It's SNOEL, S-N-O-E-L-L. -L, and that SNOEL is a mindfulness-based noticing strategy that helps us hold space for the material in our own minds. See it, name it, own it, experience it, let it go and let it float. S for see it, N for name it, O for own it, E experience it, L for 
let it go and L for let it float. And I think that they, it's very similar to the rain, but I think that that kind of let it float is kind of cool. You know, um, I'm not gonna explain the whole practice, but it's essentially a way of bringing that awareness, you know, the sensation, oh, that's anxiety. That's the tightness, that's the heaviness. That's the stories of the mind. That's the feeling. That's, um, and then in the ownership of it, it's like, um, oh, this is what's really happening here. It's not like we're just blaming. Well, you're triggering me or that's triggering me. Even if it is triggering you, you're owning your own experience. You're saying, oh, this is arising inside of me. This is what's getting triggered by these external conditions. Um, I've been hearing, you know, people, well, well, you, you triggered me. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> something I said, something I did, you know, it's like, oh, I guess I need to own that and still maybe say, hey, I didn't like the way you said that or don't talk to me like that or whatever. So that the letting it float, maybe I'll, look at that piece, um, is, is this kind of um, allowing it all, the way I interpret it, in the spaciousness of awareness. Like again, it points to that refuge of, in, of the Dharma where it's impersonal, it's not self. It just arises in causes and conditions. And, and as we let it go, it just, all these things just float in the space spaciousness of awareness. I'd like to share um, another piece from Mingya Rinpoche. And this, there is this article he wrote on inner, the inner and outer refuges. If you want to look it up on Lions Roar, you, uh, you can also access it yourself. But I really thought this was another unique way of talking about taking refuge in the, in the inner refuge of the Buddha within, not just the historical Buddha or the Dharma of our within, our own inner wisdom, or the Sangha, the community of practitioners that support us. Um, and he says something kind of funny about that too. But he says that, um, you know, with all of these, sorry, some people interpret Buddha nature as a kind of object. Um, and our metaphors might contribute to this misunderstanding. We speak of Buddha nature as a, dharma, as a diamond or an internal compass. It might sound like a physical organ, such as the heart or the lungs, but it's more than that. He says, it's more like mustard oil that thoroughly suffuses every particle of the mustard seed but becomes evident only when the seed is pressed and the coarse matter eliminated. The oil is never separate from the seed, nor did it occupy a specific location within the seed. We obtain oil through refinement. We might say through purification, yet that's what we always, yet what we get was always there. So that oil within the seed is like the purification. The obscurations are removed and we see who we truly are. The clouds part. And that's also what I love about the Dharma rain. The Dharma rain is, is a washing. It's also suffusing. It's soaking. We're soaking in it. We're soaking in it. Rumi has a beautiful poem of the chickpea where the chickpea keeps popping out of the pot and he pops it down with the spoon. You know, go ahead, you know, dissolve into the broth. You'll become more flavorful. You'll become this other, you'll, you, by letting go of this false kind of hard chickpea self, um, we can become soft and we can be, be like that oil and that, that clarity, that awake that um, all the metaphors you want to use, I guess. But I just love it because again, it's another pointing to it's already here. It's something that's we're 
we're refined, that's being cleared away so we can truly see who we are, that that is our nature, spacious, free. So, um, and then I'm just going to include because Sangha is so important. It's so hard to separate the three refuges, but at the same time, you know, the Dharma is the, the sort of umbrella of all, but the, um, the wisdom. So in the Sangha, he says, people tend to minimize the importance of ordinary Sangha. Buddha's a big deal. Dharma's a big deal. The Sangha is something to put up with, right? Yet it is with the ordinary Sangha, monastic or lay Sangha, that the roughest edges of our arrogance and pride can be smoothed down a little. Americans with their car obsessions have a good expression for this. This is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but um, you know we're in the Zoom room when we're in the Sangha and everybody's there, maybe even on the Zoom room too. Um, you know, there's all kinds of things that come up in the context of, of sharing the path with like-minded or different-minded practitioners. Um, I mean, I could tell you stories, <laughs> but you know, there, there's many teachers talk about Dharma, Dharma romances, Dharma vendettas, you know, the way somebody sits, the way somebody blows their nose, um, you know, all kinds of things can happen, you know, especially in a silent retreat. Oh my God, there's people you just want to, to throttle. There's people you want to bow to their feet. There's people that, um, you know, you, you want to hold. There's people you want to stab. There's everything that happens in that context. And, and then, you know, there's people that we love and we want to sit by them and be like them. And, you know, and then there's just all the habits, you know, um, um, all these different things can arise. Does anyone know about that? You know, and it might be in your most intimate relationships or with your friends and, but uh, the Dharma families, um, they, they are, I think Mark has talked a lot about the potatoes in the barrel. You kind of rub, a, rub each other, you know, rub off some of those edges. And, um, and that actually that's part of the path. Part of the path is that we're always kind of at working at the edge of our practice. Things come up that shake us. And just saying this both as a practitioner and also as um, um, from my experience in integrating the Dharma into working with people in therapy is that when people say things like, well, I still get angry or this still upsets me or I'm still like this or I know better, I've been practicing. How come I, I still, this still happens. I still get caught. I'm like, um, the fact that you're aware that you're caught is like amazing. The fact that it arises again and again is the humanity and how it is. And it's not about still, it's more like um, the space to say, um, like, it doesn't matter. It's not about becoming perfect. It's just like things will arise and causes and conditions. And it's not, it's nothing, there's, there's no place that it's not okay. That it, it, like, I can't say, well, now I've practiced X amount of decades, I'm free. I mean, that's just complete BS. So, you know, like let go of those expectations. Don't shame yourself. Don't blame yourself. Just go, oh, okay, this is arising now. I'm caught. I'm at the edge of my practice. I'm aware. I'm aware I'm caught. It feels like this. I use my rain. I use my snow well. I use my, oh, spaciousness. Sometimes I need to reach out to a Sangha member and make a call. Oh my gosh. I am like so, you know, and then just surrender, surrender, surrender to the law of the Dharma, surrender and, and take refuge in um, the Dharma, Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha to support you because um, um, things arise. So I'd like to close this part and leave time for a few 
sharing your questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to quote Rumi in a, a poem that I love that I've, I've used before called Buoyancy in the theme of Dharma reign and the Dharma's protection. There's a buoyancy. So the sea journey goes on. Who knows where? Just to be held by the ocean is the best luck we could have. It's total waking up. Why should we grieve that we've been sleeping? It doesn't matter how long we've been unconscious. We're groggy, but let the guilt go. Feel the motions of tenderness around you, the buoyancy, the buoyancy. Um, Donna Faludes says, Al oh, Rilke says this. It's from Sharon's book as well, she quotes him. So you must not be frightened. If a sadness rises up before you larger than anything you've ever seen, if restiveness like light and cloud shadows passed over your hands and over all you do, you must not think that life has forgotten you. Go in and in. And Donna Faludes invites us. She says, go in and in. Be the space between two cells, the vast resounding silence in which spirit dwells. Be sugar dissolving on the tongue of life. Dive in and in as deep as you can dive. Be infinite, ecstatic truth. Be love conceived and born in union. Be exactly what you seek, the beloved singing yes, tasting yes, embracing yes, until there is only essence, the all of everything expressing through you as you go in and in and turn away from nothing that you find. So um, I'd like to open up for any comments or questions before we do our closing and um, um, offer the benefit. So feel free to unmute. Maybe just, just if you'd like to check in what you're aware of and um, anything else you'd like to share about, um, um, you know, how you're, how you're practicing the Dharma. You know, um, what I love is that there's so many gateways and practices within the Dharma. There's so many, um, um, the Dharma is so vast and we can all um, find our different ways of accessing and benefiting and developing wisdom and compassion, awareness. So anything before we close? I'll just say thank you, Mira, and that um, I, I don't even remember what it was that I had to do tonight, but I thought that sitting was the right thing. And it, it always amazes me how um, that delivers something good for my heart when I do it. And I don't always know that that's coming. Um, and you'd think that after having it come every 
time that I would learn that it's going to come, but I don't always, you don't know what's going to happen. But there's always something, there's always something here. So thank you for making the space. One of um, my teachers, Kamala Masters, has said things like the Dharma cares for those who care for the Dharma. It's like it kind of takes care of us. And I just trust that, not to personify the Dharma, but it feels like an intimate friend. And it's, it's not the expectations. You know, I can sit down and be distracted the whole time or be filled with sorrow, with heartbrokenness for the world. And um, or, or your own loss, or um, or you could be filled with joy. But I think more and more that that my expectations and that my practice has its own momentum, and it's not even about me. <laughs> it's just that I just need to keep showing up as best I'm able, and let go, and like, and then you know, it's like get in the water, and um, you know. Um, and, and when you fall out of fall in or you start to flail around, you, you're kind of like, okay, and begin again. And, and um, but that everything becomes Dharma practice. You know, it's kind of like there's nothing outside of, of um, the Dharma. It's kind of like, um, so I, I do, I really take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And, um, I love that. It's like, okay, uh, I have no idea what the F is going on. So, you know, you guide me. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. 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 Wherever the path leads, however it unfolds, is really this, this is happening. And often it is the adversity, the adversity that we learn, right? That we find the home within the home like Eric was saying, so yeah, Just, uh, but not easy, not easy, not easy to become, you know, be pressed into oil, <laughs> to be refined. The obscurations get pretty thick sometimes. So um, this is, I'd like to take this something from here from a beautiful, um, way of um, dedicating the merit of our practice. And, um, and then again, I apologize if there's anything that I've said or shared that was not uh, helpful, throw it in the garbage can, take what fits. And uh, just wish you many um, Dharma blessings and um, grateful to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you for your practice. And let's take a moment to sit and then I'll, I'll guide the final closing and then I'll turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Mary, for being our, our Zoom host today. You're serving the Dharma. So sit for a moment or two. And then may we express loving kindness towards each other so that world conflict and every type of strife can come to an end, allowing peace, harmony to pervade the entire world. And by this merit, may all attain awakening, perfect awakening, arising above the forces of negativity, going beyond the ocean of samsara. May we find liberation among the turbulent waves of birth, old age, sickness, and death. May all sentient beings know true peace, happiness, and freedom. Peace, peace.